Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is Do You Need That Game? This is a monthly series I do, looking back at the past month, all the games I reviewed in the past month, talking about the... trying to take a bit more of a critical look at what the games bring to the table. Sure, I may have enjoyed them, or I may not have enjoyed them, but trying to figure out whether they actually do things unique, whether they are best in class, whether there are other, perhaps older, well-received games that I can recommend as alternative replacements. And if you like this series, if you want to see more like it, I do have over on Patreon, I do have an exclusive series where I do the same thing for Kickstarters. But with that, let's go ahead and jump into it. Timestamps as usual down below. I try to be as... I try to put my own opinion aside as much as possible, although inherently that's hard to do. I'm trying to focus on uniqueness and not just whether I personally enjoyed it. But starting off, and this is going to be all in alphabetical order, going through all the games I reviewed this past month, which is apparently a lot. And so starting off, we have Calico. Calico, a puzzly game from, from the Flat Out Games. Worth noting, I'm not going to be going into every single game and what they do, how they do it. It's going to be brief few sentence overviews for the most part. But Calico is a little puzzly game of trying to build out, well, you know, a quilt, a quilted area. Every turn you're trying to select a tile, putting it down to fulfill a variety of scoring objectives. It's a puzzle. That's what it is. Uh, overall, I really do like this one. I think this one is one of the better ones in the genre of games that do this. And there's a lot of games that do this. A lot of games where it's all about trying to fulfill multiple scoring objectives with single placements here and there, a lot of the best ones, in my opinion, are going to be from recent years, from this past year. We have uh, Calico, we have Cascadia, we have Luna Capital from Devere Games. There are a bunch of solid alternatives. I do think Calico is worth taking a look at. I think it's meaty, I think it's tight, I think it's very, very good at what it's doing. Plus, of course, it looks gorgeous, which does not hurt. We have Corral. Corral from, from, uh, jeez, uh, from... Corral from, I'm blanking on this, uh, the, the people who did Glenn Moore. Glenn Moore, I'm trying to remember the name. Fun Tales? Maybe? No. Maybe. I can't recall. Either way, uh, Corral. Corral is a game on Kickstarter, or possibly on Kickstarter, that brings you a modular approach to a entry-level game. From from Klaus Jurgen, uh, Design of Carcassonne, it's bringing you a a modular system of building out pyramids as you go. So you're going to be moving your little person around a track and then slowly building out pyramids, taking various actions. The modular part is the fact that it brings you multiple expansions and ways you can augment and implement and integrate different mechanics into your game. Uh, overall, is a solid game. I enjoyed it. I don't know if it's something that I think is best in class. I, I don't think it is best in class. I think it's solid. I think it's fun. I enjoyed it. But then if you want that modular approach to, to gateway games, because that's the way I'd focus on it. it. It very much is a modular approach to a gateway game, leveling up the players as they go. The problem is, I'd recommend Carcassonne first and foremost if you want that. If you're trying to introduce people to a set of accessible mechanics, ones that you can slowly augment as you develop, I'd recommend Carcassonne with a bunch of expansions. Get a Carcassonne big box and slowly add the expansions as you go. That will have a similar effect from the same designer, and I think it does it better. Or if you're looking for something a little heavier, if you think Carcassonne's a drop later, then I'd recommend uh, Glenn Moore from the same publisher. Not the same designer, but the same publisher, where they also take a modular approach to giving you a solid medium weight game and then adding the modules as they go. I think Corral is fine, but I'd recommend Carcassonne and Glenn Moore as being, well, better options on the table. Then we have Cascadia. Cascadia. See what I said about Calico above. Cascadia right below it over here. Same idea. I actually prefer Cascadia over Calico, but again, I think that they're both best in class. I think they're both amazing what they do. Uh, for myself, I think this genre of games, the three I'd pick the most at the moment, are Cascadia, Calico, and Luna Capital. Again, they're newer games. The the games that from you know yesteryear or whatever that do the same thing, I think these ones do do it better. Maybe it's called the new speaking. I don't know but I think they are better. Then we have Collab. Now, I won't be overly going into Collab. Collab is a cancelled Kickstarter, and I know they're looking at changing different aspects, including gameplay, so I won't heavily go into that one. I really need to see what the changes are that are coming before I go into it. Where Collab currently stands is that it's basically two halves of the game. One half I really enjoyed, thought it was a very solid puzzle. The other half was a little bit slower and fiddly than I'd like, so depending, and I know they're aware of that, so depending on the changes they make, that changes the conversation of where that one ends up. Then we have Dice Throne Marvel. Dice Stone Marvel over here, and the short version is, I don't think Dice Stone Marvel is best in class in terms of mechanics, but I do think Dice Stone Marvel is very, very solid and accessible, giving you a, a gateway basic mechanic. Think King of Tokyo, think, I mean, it's Yahtzee, it's rolling dice multiple times to try to get what you want, but it's a head-to-head -head game once you do that. Or you can turn a cooperative by getting Dice Stone Adventures. 
I do not think it is the meatiest, heaviest game out there. I think it is beautiful, it is easy to teach, it is rewarding. The Some of the more complicated characters can offer you more of a puzzle, whereas the basic characters, I think, are just kind of roll dice and activate the basic abilities, a little bit less than the strategy. I think Dice Stone is not an essential game as a strategy gamer, so to speak, but I think Dice Stone Marvel is amongst best in class as a, as a gateway plus gamer, giving you, again, accessible, beautiful, easy to teach, easy to play, and fun to play. As far as Marvel... It's basically a Marvel IP pasted onto your favorite Dice Throne characters. Different characters, to be very clear, when I say pasted on, I do not mean it's the same characters. I mean that they're giving you just, you know, hey, this box over here is Black Panther versus, Ca versus um, Captain Marvel. A whole bunch of other characters are going to be in the current Kickstarter. I don't know exactly how many they will have. I know they'll have at least eight. I don't know if they'll have more than that. But yeah, it's a solid IP pasted on top of a solid accessible game. So if you're looking for something in that weight class, in that range, then Dice Stone Marvel is pretty solid. We have Drop Drive. Drop Drive, which I think recently funded on Kickstarter. That one is, I think it's over. It might still be going. It's possible. Either way, Drop Drive is the newest iteration from the same people who brought you Dungeon Drop. I think Drop Drive brings more of a strategic overlay to that mechanic while giving you the same, you know, gimmick, so to speak, of just dropping a bunch of components. That was a loud click. Dropping a bunch of components onto your, well, sun where it spreads out across the galaxy. I think it's a gimmick, but a gimmick that will pull people in. And I don't know a lot of other games that have that same gimmick past Dungeon Drop, and I easily recommend Drop Drive over Dungeon Drop. I would say if you're looking for someone who, if you're someone who's looking for gameplay first and foremost, I wouldn't recommend Drop Drive as being, well, best in class. But if you appreciate and enjoy the gimmick, I think Drop Drive iterated well upon Dungeon Drop and gives you that same gimmick, but in more of a reason to dive into it, more strategy bite for it. If you are primarily playing that game with younger kids, then Dungeon Drop might still be a better choice because it's just simpler and more accessible. Drop Drive, I think, is actually great for the same kids you were playing Dungeon Drop with, you know, three, four years ago, and now you want to teach them or expose them to something new. Then we have Forgotten Treasure. Forgotten Treasure is a little light card play game. I enjoyed my plays of it, but in general, I don't like that genre at all, which makes it harder for me to know what's quote-unquote best in class in that genre. The biggest name in that genre is going to be Exploding Kittens. That's the biggest name in the genre of have a deck of cards that you're all simultaneously drawing from, play cards, and do whatever. And if your goal is a fun party time experience, I think Exploding Kittens does it much better. Uh, Forgotten Treasure is going to lean a bit more towards strategy, but in that genre, I don't see enough strategy to lean that way. So I don't know exactly who the target audience is for these games, for this entire genre of just decks of cards, playing cards, doing whatever. I think Forgotten Treasure is fine. Ultimately, pun, I guess, intended, I think with time it will be forgotten. We have Fractal. Fractal is a fast, punchy 4X game, and one that I really enjoyed while also being uh, not having necessarily the best experience because of my, well, prototype access to it. I got that one mid-campaign, and I didn't have a lot of time to play it, so I got in one and a half plays before reviewing it, which was, frankly, not enough time to call it a review, which is why I called it a first impressions. As far as my first impressions of Fractal, I think the iconography was pretty brutal to get through a lot of work and made the initial experience a little harder than I would like, but past that, I think it delivers on being an accessible half an hour per player 4x experience while giving you enough strategy and choices through it. There are lots of aspects of the game that I liked. It's really being compared in terms of comparable, in terms of best in class, it's going to be compared to other 4x games that play quickly. Now, Stellaris is going to be one of those. Stellaris is in a Kickstarter that ended that is not yet delivered and claims to be in that same playtime. I haven't played Stellaris, so I don't know. A Last Light from Rory Canada is another fast, punchy 4X game that, again, I, I mean, well, that one I actually have played and that one I can recommend. I think Last Light is a little lighter, though. Not pun intended that time. That just happened. But Last Light is a bit lighter. It's focusing much more on the speed. Last Light was a game that I played a four-player game in an hour. In an hour on TTS, I played a four-player game. That is absolutely insane but I think it was lighter than Fractal was. Fractal is a little bit more meaty while still being short. A good another comparison might be Warpgate, but again, that's one I haven't actually played. So I don't have a lot of comparisons in terms of shorter 4X games that I can compare against Fractal. I would say it's worth paying attention to, but I don't have enough comparison of the types of shorter 4X games for me to really say best in class or not. Furnace. Furnace, which is somewhere over here. Furnace by, by, by Arkane Wonders. This one is... So it depends how you look at it. 
Furnace is effectively a research churning engine game with a bit of a unique bidding mechanism where even when you lose, you're winning, and sometimes you actually intentionally want to lose, which adds a fascinating element at play as you place out your various bids to earn these cards that then turn into this research churning, resource converting engine to ultimately gain points across four rounds. I do not think it is the best resource churning game out there. I also don't think it's the shortest resource churning game out there, but I think for the playtime, it is the most rewarding at a short and accessible playtime in terms of resource converting games out there. So for example, if you want the best resource converting game, my instinct is still to lean towards Uwe Rosenberg's, La Uwe Rosenberg's La Havre. I think La Havre is one of the best turn this into that across multiple rounds as you earn points, and then boom, it's it's, it's just a ton, ton of fun. It's very variable, especially if you have the uh, Le Grand Hameau expansion. I really like La Havre, I think it's really solid. Also, it can run two hours plus, where Furnace clocks in at around 40 minutes or so, making it much quicker. If you want something even quicker than that, Oh My Goods from Alexander Frister, I believe, is another great little Reese's Converting game, but I don't like Oh My Goods quite as much as I like uh, Furnace. I think Furnace falls into that sweet spot of being the best at a shorter playtime from the games I've played, so I really do recommend taking a look at Furnace and seeing whether it's a fit for you, assuming, of course, you like resource converting games. Then we have uh, Hegemony. Hegemony is, well, not on the table over here. Hegemony is a new one with strong asymmetry in a Euro game where you play out these different factions. I think, you know, it's more of an economic factions. You have the middle class, the upper class, the, um, the upper class, middle class, and lower class, and then you have the state, basically. All of them fighting for their own people, so to speak, of trying to figure out, well, who wants what? So, for instance, the upper class wants less taxes on their money because they own all the companies. The people want free education and free healthcare because they have all these play people who actually need those things. So you're trying to fight over different, uh, that different, different policies, so to speak, as you vote in the game, as you try to figure things out, as you play out your own game, and you deal with whatever your unique faction has to deal with. So you're all playing with the central area, but really playing out your different games. I think hegemony is almost inherently unique because asymmetric games generally have not been strong Euro games, at least not that I'm aware of. We have Root, which is best in class in terms of asymmetry, at least I think it is. Then we have games like Chaos in the Old World, we have games like Merchant's Cove. Merchant's Cove is likely the most similar in terms of being an economic-ish game, but it doesn't really have the same Euro vibe that it is a Euro game, to be clear but doesn't have the same degree of like a heavy Euro vibe that Hegemony brings to the table. Hegemony is unique in what it's doing just by the very nature of being strongly asymmetric, heavy Euro, long three to four hour long game, which means it's both something that I think is worth paying attention to. If you like asymmetry and you value what they're doing, I think it really does a solid job at the puzzle it's providing. I also think it's a very long game. So you have to factor that in before you decide if you personally are interested in adding that to your collection. My own bias tends to be that if your game, if, if a game crosses the three hour mark, the chances and frequency of it getting played are harder and harder, especially for me with a game that's best at four players, because I have, well, so many games in my collection that are best at four that I'd much rather play instead of that. So I really like Tegemony. I think it's solid. Uh, I do want to keep it in my collection, at least for right now. It's To be clear, it's a prototype. It's not yet available. But I don't know how often it will hit the table and whether it will justify its existence over time. Then we have Kabuto Sumo. Kabuto Sumo from Board Game Tables. That one is definitely completely unique in terms of best in class of what it's doing. It's basically a little point puzzle from point coin puzzle from these arcades where you push these little coins onto a platform and knock things off. Very unique in what it's doing, which makes it stand out on that merit alone. The problem is, I think myself and many others have had issues with just how rewarding that coin puzzle ends up being versus how frustrating and slowed down it is. That said, I've seen multiple house rules in terms of the way you can actually approach the game. Anything from ways to that you can or can't hit your own uh, sumo wrestler back on the board, anything to pushing further into the center ring or pushing with a bit of a jolt. I've seen different options on the table to make the experience better, and they're all worth paying attention to if you enjoy that game and if you're curious, well, how can you make it as good as possible for yourself? So it's inherently unique which makes it worth paying attention to. For myself, I wasn't as pulled in because I found the puzzle in theory good, but the execution to be more pushing and less rewarding, but it's unique. So if you think you'll like it, I would say just search around for house rules to make sure your experience is as ideal as possible. We have King Hill, King Hill, which is over here. King Hill is a tough one. King Hill is a game that plays best at two players, which inherently, it's a weird game. Okay, let's go back to the game. King Hill is a worker placement game with aspects of, of, let's say, Hearthstone, where you have, you know, rows of creatures that will be attacking each other, trying to punch through to the enemy. At the same time, it's a game that plays only at two players. 
And that's just some of the mechanics at play. There's a lot going on at King Hill. No other game I've played truly feels like it. And to that end, I think it is unique and is worth paying attention to. I don't know, no, I don't know. I think that any of the individual mechanics of King Hill, the worker placement, the creatures, I think if you take any single mechanic of King Hill, other games do it better. I think if you take the whole package of King Hill, no game I've seen really does it quite the same way. Is it absolutely essential? I don't think it is. Does it do what it does really well for a two-player experience? I would say yes. If you are someone who likes worker placement and you play a lot of two-player games and you don't mind a bit of Hearthstone-style creature combat, the combination of all those make King Hill worth paying attention to. If any of those words did not sound appealing to you, then I'd recommend passing on it and finding something else instead. Then we have Cocopelli. Cocopelli, which is over here. This is by Stefan Feld, and it's definitely not one of the best Stefan Feld games I have played, but it is one that recently surprised me. Cocopelli was one that I wasn't expecting to, to like, but it really was a lot of fun. It's primarily focused on card play, which is one of the reasons it stood out as being different from Stefan Feld, who usually has much more of a tableau going on on the board, and this is just a bunch of cards in your hand. The actual play kind of reminds me of Dale of Merchants. Very different games, to be clear. They're not actually similar, but the general feeling of having different decks in play, different different decks at play, while you're simultaneously building up your engine, but also trying to cash in and destroy your engine so you can actually win. That aspect very much reminded me of Dale of Merchants, where you're building your deck but then destroying your deck to actually build out your stalls to win. So it had that balance of of building out your um, temples or whatever they're called um, rituals, building out your rituals, but then you have to cash in on your rituals in order to actually score points. So it had both those games had that balance. As far as which one I prefer, for right now I'm going to say Cocopelli. I think Dale of Merchants is much more charming, but I've had complaints about the strategy aspect of Coco of Dale of Merchants that I have not had those same complaints as far as Cocopelli. So for right now, Cocopelli is one that feels fairly unique. It has the Dominion aspect of, you know, tons of decks, tons of cards, and you only use a subset each time, so there's large amounts of variability. It is a heavy card-based system. It's one that I definitely recommend two to three plays before you say it's not for you. It takes a little bit to pick up on the puzzle of what it's doing and how it's doing, but overall, really enjoy that one. And, and again, I don't have a ton of strong comparisons. The strongest comparison I do have is Dale of Merchants, and I prefer Cocopelli. We have Lords of Ragnarok. Lords of Ragnarok from Awakened Realms. This is a tougher one to compare against because inherently it's being compared against Lords of Hellas. What I would say is, if you have Lords of Hellas, and you really like Lords of Hellas, I don't think Lords of Ragnarok is essential. Now, to be very clear, they play very differently. They, they have the same core mechanics at play, such that I still don't think I'm keeping both of them. I don't know when I'm making a decision about this, but I don't think I'm going to keep both in my collection, because... Lords of Hellas and Lords of Ragnarok have the same prim primary DNA at play. The actual ways they play out is very different. The bias I have is I think Lords of Ragnarok is a game that I prefer compared to Lords of Hellas, but I think Lords of Ragnarok feels a bit more like, let's say, Blood Rage or more Chaos in the Old World or any of these more punchy, aggressive games, whereas Lords of Hellas feels a little less punchy, a little less aggressive, and a little bit more controlling. So while I think I prefer Lords of Ragnarok more, I need more time to see for sure, while I think I prefer Lords of Ragnarok more than Lords of Hellas, Lords of Ragnarok is fighting in a spot that other games do more of that punchiness, which makes it very hard for me to say which ones I'm keeping. I would say if you have games like, again, Lords of Hellas and then Kemet, then you're basically fulfilling both the strategic core mechanics and DNA that Lords of Ragnarok provides, while also getting the punchiness in other games. If you don't have Lords of Hellas, then I think Lords of Ragnarok is worth paying attention to. If you have a bunch of other punchy, aggressive games, such as, uh, again, Kemet, uh, Blood Rage, other games like that, then I don't know if you need this one. I would say you don't. It's expensive. It's going to cost you money, and there are plenty of good games. Blood Rage is still my favorite all-time, my favorite area control game of all time, and so there's lots of other options in the game that on the table that won't necessarily cost you as much. But if you really want it, I mean, that's not the point of this. You don't you don't need it if you have these other games. And I would recommend Blood Rage first, for sure. It's much cheaper. And then we have Magical Friends. Magical Friends, which when you're watching this may or may not be still being on Kickstarter, I don't know. My recommendation there was it would be get Small World first. If you like Small World and you want something like it, then pay attention to Magical Friends. And that's primarily price-based uh, because the Magical Friends is a, from a small creator and that means the price is significantly higher. It's going to cost you almost twice the price of Small World. Not necessarily twice, but it's going to cost you a decent chunk more than Small World will. And they both very much give me the same feel. One with a little bit more area control, one with a little bit more racing. But the general feeling uh, of trying to manipulate different factions at play for their benefits, both of them have that. So again, I'd recommend Small World first. If you already have Small World and you like it, that's when Magical Friends can enter the picture. Then we have Megapulse. Megapulse, which is down over here. 
Mega Pulse is a racing game. It's very similar to Death Blows All Stars, to Tiny Turbo Cars. I, I think that this genre, and I'm curious, there's probably a whole bunch of others that I'm not thinking of. I didn't really play a lot of these racing games until recently, so the ones that I've played are all ones that are on Kickstarter and really haven't really hit our tables yet. So yeah, Death Blows All Stars, Tiny Turbo Cars, and Mega Pulse are all racing and shooting games at the same time. I've played racing games, but racing and shooting combined, I, I know this Car Wars out there, I never really played it, so I don't know what other options there are, but those are the three I've played recently. All three of them do things very differently. I'd have to just talk to you on an individual one-to-one -one level to tell you which one I think is better for you. I'd have to ask you a bunch of questions. Do you prefer more of a circular map? Do you prefer, you know, aggressive? Do you prefer more strategic card play? Do you prefer more time-based? There's all these different factors that go into each one that make one better than the other. What I will say is, at least for myself and my own bias, you definitely don't need more than one of these games. I think they all fill that like half strategy, half frenetic party game mix in terms of what they're doing for your table. I don't think you need more than one of them. As far as which one, that's a little harder question to answer. Now, if you're someone who has multiple racing, shooting up card games, whatever it is, and you like them, then I guess go for all of them. Be You do you. For myself, it's, uh, again, this is the balance of trying to give uh, not opinions based on not my own opinion, but they're inherently based on my own opinion. So yeah, uh, for myself, I only need one of them. I don't know which one stays, which ones go. I just can't imagine that they'll see enough playtime to just to justify owning all three of these in this genre. Then we have Mythwin. Mythwin, which is definitely an incredibly unique game. Now, this is one where I'm definitely biased against it, against this one. Mythwin is a game that's not for me. It's not a game that I enjoyed playing. That's not entirely true. It's a game I enjoyed playing briefly until you figure out that there's really no nothing to go for. See, Mythwin is a game that doesn't have a win condition. There's no loss. There's no win. There's no time. You just keep playing until you're done playing. You pack it up and then continue the next time you go. Think games like Stardew Valley. I think games like Animal Crossing, Rollercoaster Tycoon, any of those, any sim game. Mythwin is a game that promises you the experience of building for the sake of building. Now, I knew that going in, but going in, I started off, did my own thing, and then at a certain point, I think probably once I was done with the full aspect of learning, once I once I was off of my own coasting and done with the learning and just doing my own thing, it started to sink in more and more that what I did didn't matter. And granted, I knew this going in, but I thought maybe the experience of playing would be enough, but it wasn't. And I walked in with concerns about that. So what I would say for Mythwind is if you walk, if you're someone who's walking in with concerns that, Hey, a game with no win condition and a game where you can't lose, is that for me or what's the point of it? Then I would say that my experience was thinking that, playing it, and then being left with what's the point in it. Versus if you're someone who doesn't have those concerns, then it's probably worth checking out. And it absolutely, it absolutely is unique. That's for sure. So as far as best in class, there are no other games that I know of where you can't lose and you can't win and you just play until you're done playing. Then we have Pachamama. Pachamama is a deduction game that has a bit of overlap with some other games. I mean, if you think about it, if you actually, if you look on Board Game Geek in the category of deduction, there's not a lot of games that are well rated. There's like dozens and dozens of pages of games, but most of them are poorly rated games. The handful that will stick out are games like Cryptid, Search for Planet X, Alchemist, Tobago, and that's from games that actually have the same deduction type that Pachamama has. A deduction type of being given information and slowly reducing by combining the puzzle of what you know and then trying to figure out what you can deduce from different levels of play out in order to deduce what you need to know. I think Pachamama is really good at what it does. The thing that it most reminds me of is Search for Planet X. Both of them have that idea of you have a piece of perfect information, uh, you have a perfect information puzzle that you're slowly solving together. So the what the board is, is pre-known. How you interact with it and discover it, that's where the differences come into play. Now as far as those two, and I, I think that my opinion might be the minority one. It's too soon to tell because, well, Pachamama is currently on GameFound and it's not yet out there. And I think my opinion might be the minority here, but... I think that Search for Planet X will likely be better received overall. For myself, I recommend Pachamama. Because Search for Planet X is a game, I still have to review it at some point, so I'll talk about it then. My biggest complaint with Search for Planet X is the fact that you are you have your noses stuck in your own phone the entire time, and it doesn't feel like a social experience. It feels like an experience where you happen to be there to provide an element of me racing against. But the game plays like multiplayer solitaire for the most part. I enjoy the Search for Planet X, but Pachamama gives me the same puzzle, but it feels much more like we are both involved in playing the same game. It could be the Search for Planet X gives you more mechanics that might make it slightly more interesting. But that aspect of being of, of just multiplayer solitaire in this semi-involved game just really took me out of the experience compared to Pachamama, where everyone was involved. So overall, from these games, Pachamama might be one of my favorite deduction games, competitive deduction games currently out there. 
Then we have Paint the Roses. Speaking of deduction games, although this one is more cooperative based, so it's going to be most compared to, I think, Hanabi is probably a good example. Again, that aspect of limited information, deducing from others' actions, trying to read into not just what they did, but what they didn't do and what they could have done and factoring those in. So it has all of that as you play Paint the Roses. I didn't like Hanabi, which makes it hard for me to recommend Hanabi more than Paint the Roses, but Hanabi is well received. I think Paint the Roses is attractive, it's pretty, it's a cute little puzzle. I would say that directly off the bat, I'd ask you whether you prefer cooperative or competitive deduction. If your answer is both, well then get both Paint the Roses and Pachamama would be my personal recommendations. If you say one or the other, if you like cooperative deduction, Paint the Roses is probably the best cooperative deduction game I've played. And if you like competitive deduction, well, I think Pachamama is the best competitive deduction game I've played. And this is, again, specifically the genre of deduction in this type of vein. Not in games like, I don't know, uh, games like, what's, what, uh, what's that, um, what's the undercover series? Deception. Deception Undercover in Hong Kong, whatever it is, that's a different kind of deduction. So that style of deduction is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being given information, almost like uh, Sudoku, uh, playing a little bit of a slowly reducing your options and figuring out a perfect answer. So yeah, in those veins, Pachamama and Paint the Roses are amongst the best in cooperative and competitive as far as what I've played. Then we have Paleo. Paleo, which is over here, and Paleo is very unique. The game that the only game that I feel is really comparable to Paleo is Friday, Friday from Freedom and Freeze. But I like Paleo significantly more, and Paleo feels like much more of a cooperative experience because Friday is a solo game. So overall, I think Paleo is one that's worth paying attention to. I mean, it won the Spill the Showers or the Kenneth Spill. It won one of those. I don't remember which one. But I really like Paleo. I think it's a very solid puzzle, a very solid cooperative experience where you really feel like you're figuring out your tribe and your situation as you go through it. Solid game that is worth, it's really worth picking this one up. I feel it is best in class and something that's really worth paying attention to. Then we have Power Plants. Power Plants from KTBG. Power Plants is, it's area control for kids. I would say offhand, if you're looking at this as a good area control game, it's a fun, puzzly fighting area control game, but it's not one that I think is essential or necessary if you're looking at it in the status of, you know, adults who like area control games. This one is much lighter than that and a little more random in the feel of just being punched back and forth. It doesn't have the same level of control as the area control games you're probably playing. On the other hand, if you're looking at it as, well, area control games for kids, because it's KTBG, Kids Table Board Games, well, I don't know any other area control games for kids. I'm sure they exist, but they're not coming to mind at the moment. And so for that sense, if you're looking for a family-friendly introduction to area control, or even just gateway gamer, then I think Power Plants is a great gateway choice for area control. Uh, if you're past gateway, then I wouldn't recommend it as best in class. Then we have Quest and Cannons. Quest and Cannons is a game that shortly, recently funded on Kickstarter, and it's really hitting that entry point, uh, accessible gateway stance in terms of what it's trying to do, which generally my recommendations there are go with the classics, go with Catan, with Carcassonne, with Seven Wonders, with Five Tribes, with Wingspan. There are so many solid gateway games that really do an amazing job that I am very rarely going to push the, the new ones that come to the table as being worth it. Like even earlier, we had Magical Friends, but I would first recommend Small World first and then Magical Friends. So it's just very hard. I think the problem with Gateway is almost to a certain extent, Gateway games have less going on, which makes it harder to stand out as being solidly unique. And generally, I'll stick to recommending classics, unless, of course, you have all those and then want more, in which case, then go for it. Resident Evil. Resident Evil is from Steamforge Games, and this is the third in the series. We have Resident Evil 3, then 2, th sorry, 2, then 3, then Resident Evil 1. I really like Resident Evil. Uh, for myself, I was going, I was originally going to compare it to Zombicide when I first was playing it. I was like, oh, this is going to be Zombicide. Zombicide's the one I'm going to keep. I'll get, re I'll review Resident Evil and I'll move on from it. But I really enjoyed it. It was significantly tighter and more tense than I thought it would be. The way I would recommend or compare Resident Evil is it's almost a cross between Nemesis and Zombicide. It has the zombie killing aspect of heroes and all that that Zombicide will provide you with static heroes to give you an ability, level up, get level up in gear. I don't think you level up past that. But then it's very different than Zombicide because every single thing you're trying to kill is much more of a threat. And it's a lot more about the situational movement and closing doors behind you and being very tactical with what you do, meaning it's a very different experience than Zombicide, and that's where it leans more towards Nemesis. The way I'd recommend it is if you personally feel like hearing Zombicide combined with Nemesis is a fun game, then I would recommend Resident Evil. It is different than many games I've experienced because it gives me the tension of the enemy in Nemesis, where every single enemy is a threat. No matter how small they are, worse enemies are worse enemies, but everyone is a threat. But if you like the, the genre of Zombicide, but you want that aspect, 
then I would recommend it. It's going to feel a bit similar to Deep Madness. Deep Madness is another option on the table. In fact, if you have Deep Madness, it might be worth passing on Resident Evil. Same idea. Both of them are giving you harder enemies and more of a situational challenge than a slaughter everything in your path kind of challenge. Then we have Somewhere Under the Rainbow, which is another one of these, uh, you know, gateways, so therefore harder to recommend options, or harder to recommend as best in class. Not harder to recommend, it's, I can easily recommend these, but as best in class. Somewhere Under the Rainbow has some of the better components I've seen in a, uh, in a game. Like the components just look absolutely amazing, very pristine, very, uh, what's it called, deluxified or whatever. But as far as the gameplay, I don't know if the gameplay is doing anything that I would call best in class. The gameplay is fun. I like it. I enjoy it. But it's it's just basically trade and th move around the board, collect some things, then trade them in, rinse and repeat until someone wins the game. It's it's fine. It's totally it's a totally fine experience, but not one that I think is you know standing out past the amazing components. Then we have somewhere no. Then we have space race. Space race is next. Space race is a hard one for me to really say what I would recommend it for because Space Race falls into the genre of games like Pipeline, games like Imperium Legends, games that really made me push and fight for every tiny little increment of what I get. I don't love that genre of games, but games like Pipeline and Imperium Legends are very well rated and Space Race is decently rated as well. Overall, I would say Space Race, if you are looking for that one, I would probably recommend Imperium Legends first. It felt very similar. The two games, Pipeline a little bit, but much more... Uh, much more Imperium Legends and Space Race very much felt like they had large degrees of similarities in the way your cards are kind of going everywhere, the way you have to kind of work to get your cards to where they need to be, and the way they make you fight for every little incremental improvement. There is strategy in the game, but not the fun, amazing punches of look what I just did strategy, so much as small minor movements. So I think I'd probably recommend Imperium Legends first, Imperium Classics, Imperium Legends first over Space Race, but again, it's a little harder for me to recommend a game when I'm not sure how unique it is and I didn't love my experience playing them. Then we have Steam Up. Down to three left. We're almost done here. Steam Up. Steam Up is a game currently on Kickstarter. This is another one that's very well executed gateway game that again because it's a gateway game it's harder for me to really say wow look how good a job you did in terms of standing out amongst a crowded space. And I think the one that it kind of felt like different mechanics but it felt a little similar to is Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep is a game that you're basically collecting these various people. They're, they're factions. You collect clerics and warriors and all these things, but ultimately you're collecting colored cubes to trade those colored cubes in for quests. It gives you a degree of tableau building, a degree of worker placement, and it has a degree of similarity or overlap with Steam Up in the sense that you're collecting various tokens and then trading them in for not quests, but steamers full of various dim sum. So it does have a small degree of overlap in the general feeling it, it gives you. I would say Steam Up gives you these asymmetric characters which change the experience of what you're going for, versus Lords of Wadi gives you quests and then lords that change what you're trying to go for. So overall, I think if you like that genre, and if it's not the theme that's pulling you, and if it's the theme that's pulling you in, I don't have any other games I can recommend that really deal with, well, dim sum. So I have nothing there. Maybe wasabi. I mean, it's not dim sum, but maybe if, they, if your genre is just like more food, there's plenty of options out there. But if it's not theme that's pulling you in, if you're looking for mechanics first and foremost, I think Lords of Waterdeep is a very similar feeling game that's very different and that I'd recommend much more. Then we have Taverns and Dragons, which is another game that unfortunately cancelled. Uh, Taverns and Dragons hopefully will be coming back to Game Found. They basically struggled past the the, the, the finish line and they, they weren't seeing the traction they wanted. And so they cancelled and will be coming back. But Taverns and Dragons, to a certain extent, felt like Rajas of the Ganges, but I would recommend Rajas of the Ganges more. I like Taverns and Taverns and Dragons. I think it's a solid game. It's basically meeple. It's, it's dice placement. You roll a bunch of dice and then you place those dice on meeples and in the, the castle in order to take your actions. And there's a bit of a rondelle as you try to figure out where where you're placing your dice to move your workers around. It's a little bit of a high level overview, but again, I think Raj of the Ganges hits a bunch of the same notes, not all the same notes, but it has the degree of dice placement. It has the river Ganges that you're slowly moving up. So it hits some of the same notes. It's just as colorful, but I think Raj of the Ganges is the better game. So I would say Raj of the Ganges is a game you should absolutely be paying attention to and trying to get your hands on. And if you like that, then Tavern Dragons might be giving you a similar yet different game at the same time. And then lastly, and most essentially, we have Too Many Bones. And this one, I'm just going to say, you should get it. Too Many Bones is amazing. You should get it. Absolutely, period. But if you want some reason not to get it, then Gloomhaven Jaws of the Line will be that reason. I think Too Many Bones is an incredible experience. It's like ranked 40 on Board Game Geek. It is one of my favorite games. Almost everyone you talk to will say, yeah, it was one of my favorite games. But you'll also have people who say it wasn't for them. And you'll also have people who don't get it because it's expensive and it's not a cheap game to dive into, especially not if you want a lot of it. So Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is another game that's going to give you that 
sort of dungeon crawl-esque experience with leveling up and strategy going on as you fight various baddies. Totally different gameplay systems. Totally different in the way they do it. But if your goal is, well, unique characters with decks of cards, or if not with decks of cards, if your goal is unique characters with abilities that you can level them up as you go through fighting escalating levels of baddies, both those games will be hitting those notes, but Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion will be cheaper in terms of, well, what it's doing. So I do recommend trying out that one as, as first, but past that, Too Many Bones, to a certain extent, I think is just best in class at what it's doing almost no matter what. And that is everything. Those are all the games I've reviewed in the past month, or at least I think they're all the games. Hopefully I didn't miss any. I will see you again next month with another one of these in terms of just trying to figure out there's a lot of good games. There have been a lot of good games and a lot, I mean, particularly this past month, I've given a lot of fours out, one or two fives, but I've given a lot of fours on my five point scale because there's just been a lot of experiences that I've really enjoyed and then there's also there's also the threes. Threes are a lot a solid as well. Just uh, not ones that I necessarily need to keep, but they're still solid games. In any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.